Now, how did we respond to all of that? Well, we did a lot of things. Obviously, we had to, to, uh, to pick everything up. We, we relocated our crews, our overhead crews, downtown. We got the mayor to, to close the street behind our building. We parked our trucks in the street. Uh, we put materials in uh, one of our parking structures uh, and put more vehicles out on the street. Uh, and we went to work restoring customers' uh, power. Uh, I did highlight here a few of the things that I think we did very well during that, uh, that period. Uh, we have about 75 key accounts, large customers, and our uh, representatives for the key accounts maintain uh, almost minute-to-minute -minute contact with those customers, finding out the status of, of their business and how we could help them if, if they needed power turned off or they needed power turned back on. Uh, it was, was very uh, important to us to have that personal contact. We did our typical press releases to the media, on our website, we had begun, uh, had started using social networking uh, maybe six months before the flood and uh, found a lot of use for social networking as we connected with our customers. Uh, our mayor had a daily uh, press conference every morning, and all the agency heads came. The, the head of our, the electric utility came, the head of the, the water utility, the police department, the fire department, the health department, et cetera. And I think as you look at these, particularly the first, the third, and the fourth item there, the whole objective was to put a personal face on the utility, the government, the responders, the people who were going to help our community recover from this disaster. Uh, and I know we've, we've heard this from, from Irwin and others. Uh, you have to provide, you have to make that personal contact. Uh, we were in a session uh, a couple of days ago where we talked about the importance of the lead executive uh, being the face of the utility. Uh, and uh, I think the mayor did a great job of getting those lead executives uh, in the forefront so people knew it wasn't just our public relations person that smiles big and, and, and does all the, the normal interviews on camera. Uh, it was us, uh, and it was our leader, and it was the leaders of, of the city who were there uh, looking out for, uh, for our citizens. The last point I want to talk about is, at the bottom, another outrageous success for us, which really deals with the Gaylord Hotel chain and the Gaylord Opryland Hotel. Um, and I'm going to show you some pictures to kind of, so you'll put this in perspective. This is the, the hotel in Nashville, the Gaylord Opryland. Uh, from the outside, um, pictures uh, in the, uh, a little uh, up close. I think they had some, some diesel fuel leaks as well that's uh, tainting the, the water there. This is inside the hotel. So if you walk back over here to the atrium uh, of uh, this hotel, think about this. This is the Delta Atrium uh, at uh, Gaylord Opryland. And let me explain. This water that's in this atrium, it's not like opening a, a faucet. It's not like a, a leaking ice maker. This is dirty water. This is water that's come out of the river. It's, come, it's got trash. It's got fuel. It's got sewage all kind of bad stuff. You don't go walking around in this. So their hotel was inundated with this filthy water. They were able to bring in uh, restoration uh, contractors almost immediately, came in with big trucks with fans and uh, uh, vacuums and all that, and emergency generators to run the equipment. But the hotel was so massive that trying to do all that with emergency generators, they quickly realized wasn't going to work. Uh, it was going to be a very, very slow process. Uh, another picture from, from that area, you see the General Jackson Riverboat. Uh, the boat and the docks were floating, but uh, nothing else did, so everything else got inundated. So they, uh, so it rained on, on the first and the second, Saturday and Sunday. Early Monday morning, they actually, well, actually late s uh, Sunday night, they evacuated the hotel, took everyone out of the hotel, put them on buses, took them to a high school. Uh, early the next, uh, shortly after midnight, they called us and said, you just need to turn off the power. We're, we're flooded. Uh, they spent Monday assessing damage and cr trying to figure out what was going to happen. Tuesday morning, they contacted us, and they said, you know, we really need electric power out here. And of course, their service is all underground. All their transformers, their mechanical equipment uh, is down in the basement of their building. It was all underwater. Uh, so we went out and met with them that, uh, that Tuesday had engineers on, uh, on site Tuesday afternoon. Wednesday morning, we had crews out putting up temporary overhead service for them. And you see the stats here, uh, 16 poles, uh, four three-phase transformer banks for them. At the, uh, I think two at the hotel, one down in the area of the Grand Ole Opry House, and one at the, uh, the Opry Mills Mall, I believe, is where they were located. 
but they now had the electricity they needed, could run, string their own cables inside to, to run fans and pumps and other equipment that they needed to, uh, to restore their hotel. Uh, Jerry Duvall, I think you went to the grand opening, the grand reopening, uh, November 15th. So May 1st, November 15th, they restored uh, the hotel in just under six months. And they, uh, Christmas season's a big, big deal at Opryland. You know, they have uh, Country Christmas. They have the Rockettes uh, at the Grand Ole Opry House. They have the ice sculpture exhibits, uh, Christmas lights, decorations everywhere, tremendous amount of walk-in traffic. Uh, it was a big deal to them, a big success to them to be open uh, by November the 15th. Uh, they have conservatively estimated that without our help and putting in temporary service, it would have delayed their opening at least another six months, if not longer. Huge revenue impact to them. So this was a case where, again, the utility was listening to the customer and uh, doing what it took to deal with their issues. There were some things that, uh, some other challenges that uh, our lessons learned that, that I did want to cover with you real briefly. Uh, in any disaster, you need to think about protecting your own resources. Whether uh, now we've identified uh, West Service Center as being flood prone, so we watched the weather closely. And a couple of times since this disaster, uh, we actually reopened after Gaylord Opryland. It was, was Christmas before we reopened out there. Uh, we now move the vehicles out. Uh, if there, there's a, a chance of flooding there, we, we've not been able to move to another location, so we just have to, uh, uh, to kind of evacuate uh, as much as we can in the event of, of a threat. Not the best approach, but uh, all we could manage in the, uh, uh, with the funds we had available. But it's very important to protect your own resources because it's your resources what you use to serve your customers. And if you don't have uh, your data center, if you don't have your, your bucket trucks and your, your, your people available, you can't do the job for your customer. Uh, we didn't do a real good job providing assistance to our employees on the front end. I talked about they came back to West Center and there were over 40 vehicles underwater. Uh, in, in the hecticness of the moment, uh, we didn't think about how they were going to get home. So they, they call their spouses, they call friends. Uh, uh, they had to find a way home that night. They had to find a way uh, back to work the next day. Uh, and they did, but uh, I think looking as we did our after action review, we didn't feel like we really thought about that step forward. It was not part of, our, uh, of any of our disaster plans. Uh, another big problem that we ran across that uh, I've discussed with others here, that, and they were writing this down, Water comes up over your home or over your building, over your electric meter, and then it subsides. In our case, it subsided pretty quickly within a day or two. But everyone rushes in to try to dry out their, their, their facility, their home, their business, because mold starts to grow within about 48 hours. You rip up the carpet, you tear out the drywall, you take out the insulation, you take out the drapes, you take out the bedding. Everything that's soft is removed so that uh, the structure, the basic structures can dry out and you don't, it's not ruined by mold. So water goes down, power comes back on in a lot of these places. Sometimes the meter is sizzling a little bit because it's been underwater, may have a little bit of mud in it. Uh, electric codes say that once a meter has uh, been underwater that it can't be re-energized. So I, I personally got a call, I think Wednesday, probably Wednesday, from a friend of mine who had a small strip office building. He said, you know, it flooded, the water's gone down, the power's back on, we're in here, we've got fans everywhere, we're trying to save our building. And you just came out, you, your, your utility just came out and turned our power off. I'm stuck. My building is going to be ruined. What do I do? Uh, it's a, this is a real tough issue because there are issues of safety. There are issues of, uh, uh, you know, codes, regulations themselves and what the code regulators say and require. Uh, it was a very difficult situation to deal with. I, I'm frankly not at liberty to explain exactly how we went about that. But it's, uh, you need to write that down. If you ever have a flood, this is going to happen, and, and, and you're going to end up putting your customer in a real bad situation. Uh, they're going to hate you if you don't have some kind of a solution for this or have some kind of a communication plan uh, to, uh, to deal with it. Uh, another issue we had was, was minimum bills. We had people who had had to move out of their homes or businesses. We were still charging minimum bills. Uh, and uh, we didn't have any way in our IT systems or, and in our power contracts to waive those. Again, we didn't make a lot of friends. We're going to ad address that problem so that uh, in the future, if uh, our customers have to move out of their premises because of acts of God, then uh, we're going to try to provide some, uh, uh, at least we, we don't want to hurt them any, any uh, more than, uh, 
then they've already been hurt. Conclusion. Uh, crisis preparation is good. We have a disaster plan that covers a lot of things, and it has a lot of good stuff in it. We have uh, contract crews uh, under contract. We have their phone numbers. We call them. They come in to help. We have arrangements with hotels and restaurants and places to put up temporary workers that come in. We have lots of other uh, processes and procedures in place. But regardless of how good your plan is, something is going to happen that you didn't anticipate. You're going to have to to deal with it uh, in a crisis mode. And, and the best thing I can tell you in terms of dealing with crisis is just be sure to communicate with your customers. Tell them what's happened. You don't have to lie. You know, you, you've got big problems. You've lost a bunch of assets or, uh, you know, you're struggling as well. But you have to communicate with them so that they know what's going on. Just like we face in a day-to-day situation about giving expected time of restoration in a disaster like this, it, it's even more important that everyone know where you stand and kind of what to expect uh, when they can move back into their area if they'll have power to, uh, to try to uh, uh, dry out their property or restore their property. Thank you very much.